Good morning, everyone. Great to see you here this morning in person and online. We are so glad you're here to worship with us this morning. I'm going to hold off on the announcements until the end of the gathering so we give time for people to come on in and we don't want to miss anything important. But I do want to highlight the fact that if you're a first-time visitor, we'd love for you to fill out one of the cards that the ushers can give you. Make sure you sign up for our newsletter and also to let you know that we have uh, two worship gatherings for this final Sunday here, and then starting next Sunday, we'll move back to one worship gathering, 10 a.m., here in the sanctuary, and that is our plan for now. So keep praying for that. We're very excited to bring everyone back together for that, and we are grateful that you're here this morning on this Pentecost Sunday. So on Pentecost... We just went through Acts. We know that in Acts chapter 2, that the ascended Christ sent the Holy Spirit to his people to empower them, Acts 1.8, to be witnesses to all the ends of the earth. And I really appreciate the fact that on that Pentecost, we have this beautiful picture of these people gathered together in a room. The Holy Spirit comes on them just as God promised in Acts 1.8, And it says, and Peter later on in this sermon says, this is what happened at Pentecost. Exalted to the right hand of God, he, Jesus, received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit he has poured out on what you now see and hear. So at that first Pentecost, we entered a whole new era of salvation history, continuing on until the return of Jesus. So God is now dwelling among his people. We don't need the Ark of the Covenant and the tabernacle and the temple in Jerusalem. We have Christ in us, the Holy Spirit dwelling in believers through Jesus Christ, and that is the beautiful news of Pentecost Sunday. So today, as we gather to worship, I pray that each one of us would be filled with the Holy Spirit and aware of the fact that we're filled with the Holy Spirit as we serve the Lord together for his glory and his renown. Father God, thank you for the beautiful gift of the Holy Spirit. Thank you that without you, we have nothing. Lord, thank you that you are everything for us. And I pray that this church, these people, individually and as a corporate body, would be bright lights for you in this world, filled with the Holy Spirit to do your glory, because we know the church without the Spirit is dead. In Jesus Christ's precious name we pray. Amen. Our New City Catechism question for today, which is very appropriate on Pentecost Sunday, is, what do we believe about the Holy Spirit? The answer, that he is God, eternal with the Father and the Son. If you're able, please stand and join me in our call to worship. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. Nor 
You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasure at your right hand. Remain standing and sing joyfully our hymn of praise. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. opportunity to continue our worship by giving of our tithes and offerings in recognition of all that God has done for us. There are instructions in your order of worship in terms of how that giving can be done, and I trust you to be able to read those instructions and follow them. Join with me in a prayer for our offering. Gracious Heavenly Father, you have given us so very much that were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. May we give with that attitude of ourselves and all that you have given to us that you may be glorified here in Santa Barbara and around the world. Thank you for the ministry partners that you have brought into contact with us who are indeed fulfilling the great commission of taking the gospel to Jerusalem, Judea, Judea Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Thank you that the gifts that come into El Montecito Presbyterian Church are used for your glory in spreading the gospel news, the message of your grace and your goodness that the Holy Spirit has been given the power to exceed the kingdom of this earth with the kingdom of heaven. We pray that you indeed would be glorified with all that we give of our lives and our offerings. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Oh, 
You may be seated. Please take out your order of worship and join me in reading together the Apostles' Creed in unison as we affirm our Christian faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please stand now as we sing, Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven. Father God, I want to thank you for this opportunity to gather together in this place at this time to give you the honor and glory that only you deserve. And I pray that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we would be equipped to trust you, to do your work, and to love you and love this world as you have loved us. In Jesus Christ's precious name we pray. Amen. Who has an order of worship in their hand? Anyone? A couple of you? Raise them up. There you go. You got those in your hands because there was a group of ushers who we should thank every once in a while. So thank you guys very much. If you'd like to be a part of that team as well, there's a lot of things. We set up communion, we get the sanctuary ready, we have all sorts of activities, but most importantly, we welcome people. We make sure that you feel like you are welcome and you get an order of worship, and I'm grateful for that team. But anyone that would like to serve in that capacity, you're welcome to volunteer for that. It's a great opportunity to get to know people. And now that we're moving back to one worship gathering, you only have to do it once on Sunday morning. So how about that? On May 5th, 1961, Alan Shepard climbed aboard his Freedom 7 capsule, perched atop a redstone rocket, sitting at launch pad 5, in Cape Canaveral, Florida. Half a million people gathered 
on that day on the local beaches to watch the launch in person. After more than two hours of delays because of technical issues, the rocket engines ignited at 9.34 a.m. Eastern Time. As the Redstone rocket fought to escape the grips of our atmosphere and gravity, things were less than calm for Alan Shepard inside that little capsule. The G-forces were so great on Shepard's body, he felt six times heavier in that capsule on the way up to space than he would have standing on Earth. Six times heavier. The Redstone rocket was actually a repurposed medium-range ballistic missile designed to launch nuclear warheads, never intended for a person to sit on top of. The launch lasted five minutes and 11 seconds to get into space. The total flight lasted 15 minutes and at an altitude of 230,000 feet, Shepard in space used his retro rockets to maneuver his capsule around. I don't know if you're a follower of the space race, but Soviet cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin may have been the first man in space, but he was just along for the ride. Shepard, an American pilot, was the first man to freely maneuver his space capsule in space. Isn't that a great picture of the difference between the USSR and the USA in the Cold War? Shepard was weightless in space for just five minutes. And then his capsule turned around and he began to re-enter the atmosphere, and the bottom of his capsule reached 1,230 degrees Fahrenheit. And on the way down from space, Shepard's body was 11 times heavier than it would have been on Earth. As a Shepard dropped, he looked up out of his periscope, and at 20,000 feet, he saw a small little drone parachute come out. And then at 10,000 feet above sea level, he looked up and saw a bright orange parachute fully unfurled. Reflecting on that moment, Shepard said, that big orange and white monster blossomed above me so beautifully, and it told me I was safe. The capsule now falling gently into the ocean, the chaos had subsided, and the splashdown in the Atlantic Ocean was perfectly done, and Shepard was picked up and put on a naval ship called the USS Lake Champlain. And hundreds of cheering Navy soldiers gathered around him to celebrate the first American into space. I'm a huge fan of history, and especially the Mercury, the Gemini, or Gemini as they call it, and the Apollo missions. And I love reading about them. And the other day, I was on my walk on, up on East Mountain Drive listening to a book written by Alan Shepard, the first American in space. And he described this first flight, and I was so captivated by it. And all I could think about as I was listening to it was this first flight into space describes so well how I feel in life sometimes. It really is a great picture of that. Everything is just quiet and calm, just like Shepard sitting on the launch pad. Everything is fine. There might be a few creaks and cracks here and there, things groaning around, but nothing too bad. You look out the window and you see the ocean waves lapping and the birds flying around. And then someone makes a poor choice, or I make a poor choice, or the realities of living in a fallen world crash in on us and suddenly... Everything goes haywire. Do you ever feel like your one phone call, one text message, one email, one evening news story away from everything just going in for a wild ride? An instant we go from calm and bright to dangerous and dark. Much like Alan Shepard, we feel like we're perched precariously on top of a ballistic missile hurling into the unknown. The weight is pushing down on us. Grief is pushing down on us. And anxiously, as we fall, we look up and hope that a parachute will unfurl to slow our descent. 
Over the next few weeks, we're going through the Psalms. We're exploring the breadth of worship. As we journey through the Psalms, we're looking at the beauty of these poems in the middle of our Bible that help shift our gaze upward to God's magnificent beauty. And today, we're going to try to allow the Psalms once again to ignite a flame in the people of El Montecito Presbyterian Church to tell the world we are alive and well and dedicated to giving God the glory that he deserves no matter what is going on in our lives. Because the Psalms address every possible human situation we could ever go through. Joy, pleasure, hope, fear, heartache, longing, doubts, you name it, it's there. And in response, we're pointed back to God every time, who he is and what he has done. And this morning, we're going to look at Psalm 30. So if you have your Bibles in front of you in the pew racks, Grab those Bibles out if you're at home, get your Bible out, open your app, whatever you look at the Bible on. We're looking at Psalm 30. And Psalm 30 is a psalm of thanksgiving. Psalm 30, in my opinion, is a bit like David being strapped to a ballistic missile and being shot up into space and then descending back to earth. And all the time, he never doubts whether his parachute will open. This psalm of personal thanksgiving for God's repeated care and deliverance has a lot to teach us this morning. So let me begin by reading Psalm 30. Psalm 30, a psalm, a song for the dedication of the temple of David. I will exalt you, Lord, for you lifted me out of the depths and did not let my enemies gloat over me. Lord my God, I called to you for help, and you healed me. You, Lord, brought me up from the realm of the dead. You spared me from going down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, you his faithful people. Praise his holy name, for his anger only lasts a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. When I felt secure, I said, I will never be shaken. Lord, when you favored me, you made me a royal mountain stand firm. But when you hid your face, I was dismayed. To you, Lord, I called. To you, Lord, I cried for mercy. What is gained if I'm silenced? If I go down to the pit, will the dust praise you? Will it proclaim your faithfulness? Hear, Lord, and be merciful to me, Lord, my help. You turned my wailing into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy that my heart may sing your praises and not be silent. Lord my God, I will praise you forever. The word of the Lord. Psalm 30 says it was composed by David for the dedication of the temple. Now, if you know your Old Testament history, this might seem a bit strange. For the dedication of the temple occurred after David's death. Solomon, David's son, was the king of Israel when the temple was dedicated. How could David write a psalm for the dedication of the temple, an event occurring after his death? Well, I trust the Bible is true, and I trust that David wrote this psalm for the dedication of the temple. The word translated temple in Hebrew is actually the word house. You actually know some Hebrew already, and it's pretty cool because you say it a lot, especially around Christmas time. Have you ever said the word Bethlehem? Bayeth lechem, house of bread. You're saying two Hebrew words right there. The word used for temple in this psalm in the Hebrew Bible is Beth. That means this house is just that, a house, but it's the temple, we're told. Now, the phrase of David could be attached to the word house, as in the house of someone who's related to David. Or that phrase of David could be associated with a psalm, a song, to mean the entire psalm was just written by David. But I don't think that's it. It was written by David, but there's more here. What is the house that is referred to here? 
It could be speaking of David's literal home, but I don't think that's the case. You remember he was a little bit worried about the fact he'd built such a nice mansion and God didn't have a temple yet. God didn't have a house yet. So I don't think that's what it was. This would mean the psalm was written when David may have built that palace in Jerusalem, but I don't think that is the case. It's possible, but I think Psalm 30 was composed for something different. Some think this might be written about Solomon's temple in, in a way that's prophetic. He's, he's imagining it will happen in the future, but I don't think that's what's happening here either. David would never see the temple with his own eyes on earth, and, and I think there's a better option here. In the Old Testament, in this time period, if you remember... The tabernacle was where the Ark of the Covenant was housed, and that's where God's presence resided on earth before the temple was made. Now we have the Holy Spirit. God is in us. The temple is there. We'll talk about that more in a second. But the tabernacle was where? It was in a city called Shiloh. Now Shiloh is the city where the Ark of the Covenant was left before it came into Jerusalem. And in 2 Samuel chapter 6, it's a great account in the Old Testament, we're told that David took the Ark of the Covenant, think Raiders of the Lost Ark, and he moved that Ark from Shiloh to Jerusalem. But the story gets better because David makes a tent, a tabernacle for the Ark in Jerusalem, but the the, the Ark doesn't make it to Jerusalem just yet. I think this psalm was written when the tabernacle in Jerusalem was dedicated to temporarily house the Ark. That means that David is remembering in Psalm 30 all the trouble that he had trying to get the ark from Shiloh to Jerusalem. And this is what happened. First, there was that account where Uzzah, you remember poor Uzzah? The ark is on an ox cart and it stumbles and Uzzah reaches out on the way to Shiloh into Jerusalem and he touches the ark and what happens to him? He dies. He dies right on the spot. David is just terrified. He has no idea what to do with this. He, he sees Uzzah touch the ark and dies, and he doesn't know what to do. He's terrified of moving the cart. He doesn't want anyone else to die. God's holiness, God's presence is right there, and it's very serious. So David gets scared. That's the first piece of trouble. And he says, we're going to put the ark now in a little while. We're going to camp it out at Obed-Edom's house. He's, he's a good guy. We'll put it at Obed-Edom's house. And Obed-Edom keeps the ark. And you know what happens to Obed-Edom's house? It prospers. For three months, the ark is there. And it is incredible. It says that Obed-Edom's house is blessed. We don't know if that's... The crops were bigger. The finances were bigger. The families were bigger. Maybe more grandchildren were born. We don't know. But they were blessed. And it was a good thing. And David sees that. And he says, okay, it's time to bring the ark from Obed-Edom's house into Jerusalem. So they start the journey, and they get the ark from Obed-Edom. Remember, it goes from Shiloh to Obed-Edom. Now it's going into Jerusalem, and they put it in the temporary tent, and that's what I think this psalm was written for, right there. And what happens when the ark enters Jerusalem? David and the city go wild. Well, most of the people in the city, David's wife was not very happy. We'll get to that in a second. They're dancing in the Bible, in the Old Testament. They're dancing. They're in the streets. They're shouting. It's extravagant praise because this is God bringing his presence into the city of Jerusalem. There were two outstretched cherubim mounted on the ark lid, and people were dancing around the presence of the living God. And David got so excited, he gets into the action. Here's King David, undignified, leaping and dancing before the Lord in the streets of Jerusalem. And this is the next time when problem comes because his wife sees David out there dancing in the streets and she rebukes him. To which David says to her, this is one of my favorite verses in the Old Testament, I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this. You think this is undignified? I'll become even more undignified And I'll be humiliated in my own eyes if it gives God glory. So David, his own wife, mocks him for the excitement of God's presence in Jerusalem. And now we have the context for Psalm 30. You had no idea a preacher could pull that much out of one little word there, did you? But I did it. 
This is the context for Psalm 30. And here we go. And David begins by saying, I will exalt you, Lord. Why is David exalting the Lord? He gives three reasons for lifting the Lord high. First, God saved David from the attacks of his enemies. Second, God answers David's prayer in desperate circumstances. And third, God has rescued David from certain death. So that's the reasons he gives in the psalm. Here's this great warrior, David. You have to remember, David is a warrior. He's a greater warrior than any of us sitting in this room today or listening to this sermon. I promise you that. He's defeated lions. Anyone here defeat a lion? No, nope. nobody's raising their hand. How about bears? Anyone get a bear, Lori? Any? Nope, almost, yeah. But got bear spray. I don't know what that's going to do with a bear. Has anyone ever defeated a giant? I this guy, David, is the real deal. He's a warrior. Not many of us can say that about ourselves. And David, with all his warrior might, never claims in this psalm to be able to save himself. How about that? David knows every deliverance, every victory, every rescue from, from any sort of evil is directly the result of the grace of God. Nothing he has done on his own. Do you remember when he was slinging that stone at the giant? Did he just sling the stone and say, I got gotcha. you? We had a friend with grandchildren, and he would play David and Goliath with them. Do this with your grandkids or your kids sometime. And the kids would pretend to throw a stone at Grandpa, and Grandpa wouldn't fall. And they say, you're supposed to fall, Grandpa. he said, no, you didn't say the right things. What do you mean? Ooh, you got to say, in the name of the living God. Then Goliath got the point. Made quite an impression on him, actually. <laughs> Come on. That was, okay. It's just a stone's throw away on that one. All right. That is the beauty of this psalm. David knows that he does not save himself from his own strength. And that's an important lesson for us to know today as well. We cannot save ourselves, but God can. We cannot bring victory, but God can. David knows God has his back. David knows God is that beautiful, bright orange blossom of a parachute that he just rescues David with. The very fact that David has breath in his lungs and strength in his hands and a mind to write this psalm is a gift from God, and he knows it. Are you giving God the glory for the big and small victories in your lives today? Are we giving God glory for the big and small victories in our lives today? David knows that God delivered him. David knows the Ark of the Covenant is safely in the tabernacle in Jerusalem, not because of his own doing. In fact, he messed it up, but because of God. David knows his victories are because of God. He knows that he has life because of the Lord. He knows this about God, and he gives him glory. David puts paper to pen, and he shouts, I will exalt you, Lord. And we're still talking about it thousands of years later. I think that is so powerful. Imagine what would happen today if we started telling people about the victories in our lives and attributed them to God. What would happen? I know what would happen. God would no longer be an abstract concept to our friends, to our neighbors, to our family. He would start to get the glory that he deserves. People would come to know God through Jesus Christ in very tangible and real way because of our witness, because we are attesting to the glory. We're on the rooftops shouting it to people. It's not about what we've done. It's all about what God's done. So we need to continue to shout God's faithfulness to the, all the corners of the earth. Anyone that will listen to us, large victories, small victories, all victories are a result of God's glory. I love how David says it so beautifully. He says, sing praises to the Lord for you, his faithful people. Praise his holy name. For his anger only lasts a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may stay for the night, oh, but rejoicing comes in the morning. David starts this psalm exalting God's glory. And now David invites all of the fellow worshipers to get in on the action. Sing praises, praise his holy name. Suffering, whether it's caused by ourselves or someone else or our sinful choices or just the result of living in a fallen world. Suffering never has the final word, David says, because in God's rich mercy and his love, he is with us and it never has final word. Yes, David says, sometimes it will feel like you are in the 
dark of the night, the dark night of the soul. Sometimes we're in the inky black of night, but as sure as the sun rose this morning and the sun will rise tomorrow, every morning the sun will rise, God will bring joy. This Pentecost Sunday, and on the first Pentecost Sunday, Peter quoted Psalm 16, 8 to 11. Did you catch that that was our call to worship today? Psalm 16, 8 says, You fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. When we're in Christ, the joy of the morning will always have the final word. And there's something else about joy, something very important in Psalm 30 that we're taught. Joy and pride can never live together in the same place. Joy and pride can never be together in the same place. Look at David's confession right there in the middle of the psalm, verse 6. When I felt secure, there's a lot of eyes here, I said, I will never be shaken. Lord, when you favored me, you made my royal mountain stand firm. But when you hid your face, I was dismayed. Right in the middle of the psalm, David falls into the same trap that we fall into on a regular basis. Everything in this world, everything in this world is saying to you, make sure you watch out for your own needs because nobody else is going to watch out for you. If you're not looking out for your own security, your own rights, nobody else is going to do it for you. You watch out for number one or this world is going to spit you up and chew you out. Chew you up and spit you out. I don't know, something like that. All of us living in this fallen world are smack dab in the middle of Psalm 30, verse 6. When I felt secure, I felt like I'd never be shaken. And if we're brutally honest with ourselves, we want to admit that we watch out for number one, and we're number one. Like David in a fallen world, we're prideful. And I pray that each one of us at some point in our lives will come to the realization that we are sinners in need of a Savior. If left to our own devices, we will always choose ourselves. We're sinners who can't save ourselves. We're like Alan Shepard hurling back to earth, and we can't stop our fall. We can't find lasting joy in our own strength. And that's why David is so vulnerable in this psalm. And then he gives us a pattern to follow. He says, call on the Lord. To you, Lord, I called in verse 8. To you, Lord, I cried for mercy. What a, what a tr shift in trajectory. What is gained if I'm silenced, if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it proclaim your faithfulness? Hear, Lord, and be merciful to me. Lord, be my help. David admits he needs God's help. In the Bible, my help or my helper is one of the most frequently used descriptors of God. Psalm 46.1, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Psalm 54.4, surely God is my help. The Lord is the one who sustains me. Psalm 121, 2, my help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And then it jumps into the New Testament, Hebrews 13, 6. So we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Why is that little word help so powerful? Because we are made to thrive in continual dependence on God. There's no room for self-sufficiency in our relationship with God. There's a professor at Boston College, his name is Peter Kreeft, and he wrote a book a while back called Back to Virtue. In it, he says, if we come to God with full hands, he finds no place to put himself. It's our beggary, our receptivity that is our hope. At the core of the Christian faith, the adventure of following God always begins with a single word, help help. And then Romans 10, 13 says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I pray that each one of us 
comes to the point in our lives, I pray that each one of your family members, each one of your friends, each one of your children, each one of your grandchildren comes to the point where they admit they cannot save themselves, but the world is not telling them that. Scriptures are. God is. You cannot find joy, lasting joy, in your own strength. And that runs counter to our culture. And when our sorrow is transformed into joy through God's love and grace, we will worship, we will give thanks and gratitude. So David concludes this psalm with with the great transformation and another glimpse of his undignified, no-holds-barred, no-holding-back worship and dancing. I love that he comes back to dancing. You turn my wailing into dancing. You remove my sackcloth and clothe me with joy that my heart may sing your praises and not be silent. Lord my God, I will praise you forever. For years now, Lori and I have read our girls the Jesus Storybook Bible. It's a beautiful account of, of the Gospels in, in children form. It's just wonderful. It's written by Sally Lloyd-Jones. I'd recommend getting a copy of it. Get it for yourself or someone with children or grandchildren. On the cover of the Jesus Storybook Bible, the subtitle is Every Story Whispers His Name. Every psalm that we're reading, every one of the 150 psalms whispers the name of Jesus Christ. And Psalm 30 points us to Jesus. Throughout the scriptures, Jesus is referred to as the greater David. He took our sin and our pride to bring us ultimate joy. And in Jesus, joy is always the final word, just like Psalm 30 says. And that is reason to be thankful and shout to the ends of the earth. That is reason to be undignified and even dance around. Even if you're like me and you don't know how to dance, you want to see undignified dance and watch me try to dance sometime. The culture, the world around us, folks, is not going to like that. The culture has no say in this, though. They don't bring us ultimate joy. They don't bring us lasting joy. The culture can't save us for eternity, but we know a Lord who can. But I think sometimes in our world, sadly, we let culture dictate our joy more than we let God's truth dictate our joy. What's going on in the world directs our joy, and that's not right. Followers of Jesus Christ should be the most joy-filled people in the entire world. But sadly... That's not the first description most people give of Christians. Sadly, Christians sometimes drift into looking no different than the world. But we need to fight that. And as we focus here at this church, at El Montecito Presbyterian Church in Montecito, California, in Santa Barbara County, here we are. I pray as we try, and this summer you've read it many times, we're trying to cultivate Christ-centered community through praying together, playing together, reading God's word together, serving and nurturing missional community together, and worshiping together. Let's look different than the world. Let's be so attractional as a community. Let's not fight with each other. Let's not eat each other up. Let's not attack each other over silly things. Let's look so different to the world that when they come in here, they say, I want to be a part of that. Have you, have you heard about what they're doing down at Elmo? You guys, anyone? It's incredible. You know how many families we had down on Santa Claus Beach yesterday? You want the pastor count or the real count? There were like a thousand people down there, it felt like. No, it was, like, it was probably 10 families, maybe 25 kids. It was fantastic. They're in the dirt playing together. We had Janet and Nate and Bruce Stockton there judging in the good way, not the bad way. And, and we had a golden shovel as a trophy. And we laughed and we created. And the people walking up and down the beach, you know what they were doing? Hey, I don't want to be a part of that. No, they'd walk up to us and say, what are you building? What are you guys, are you guys part of a group? 
Yeah, we're part of El Montecito Presbyterian Church right there in Montecito. Really? That is so cool. People brought their neighbors who may have never come to El Montecito Presbyterian Church. One guy pulled me aside. He said, we were talking about the Old Testament on the way here in the car. This family doesn't go to church. But they're talking about the Old Testament in the car because the theme for the Sandcastle contest was epic events in the Old Testament. Do you guys want to be a part of that? Oh, I want you to be a part of it. That is the kind of joy we want to have in this community. We're talking about our basement space, repurposing that to make this church an alive church, a church where people say, there's a lot going on there that we can get involved in, and then we point people to Jesus Christ and an understanding of who God is in this world, and we make a joyful impact in their lives. Anyway, I could go on and on about how exciting this is and all the cool things happening, but I got to finish up this Psalm 30 here because I got to ask a question. How do we apply Psalm 30 today? You know what? We don't have the ark, but we do have God's presence. This is Pentecost Sunday, and you all know that as followers of Jesus Christ, we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, God in us, our hope of glory. God is now dwelling among his people. God is dwelling in his people. God is here in this place, not through the Ark of the Covenant or the tabernacle or the temple in Jerusalem. God dwells in those who know Jesus Christ as their Savior individually and corporately in this body as a church. And today as we worship together, I pray that we are filled with the Holy Spirit and we want to serve the Lord together for his sake and for his glory Because God dwells in each one of us individually and in this church as a body. And we're stronger together as a body. And the living God is here in this place today with us. And he is with us every day. But he's among us in a special way as we gather together here in this place. And people come together and give him the glory that he deserves in a concentrated and focused and wonderful way. So let's continue to worship the Lord with thanksgiving. Remember, in Jesus Christ, joy is always, always the final word. Father God, I am so thankful for this opportunity to be here in this place, to go through your word together as a body, to be an attractional body of Christ in this community, Lord. I pray that you would continue to bring health and vitality individually and corporately to El Montecito Presbyterian Church, not for our glory, but for your glory and your renown. And Lord, for anyone out here that's just looking up right now and feels like they're hurling back to earth in thousands of miles an hour without any hope, may they trust, Lord, in you, in your beautiful parachute of love and care and gentleness, and may we rest in that truth today. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand now together as we sing, Come People of the Risen King. What a great descriptor.
David, as we confess our sins to God in preparation of celebrating this communion meal together. We'll read together in unison as found in your order of worship. Father in heaven, we thank you for the freedom you have given us through the life, death, and resurrection of your Son. Liberate us from spiritual slumber and apathy. Inspire us with Christ's vision for a world reborn. Help us to recognize our gifts for ministry and use them in service to others. Transform our hearts and minds. Fill us with love that overflows. Remind us that there is no greater calling than to love you with all that we are and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Come, Holy Spirit. Forgive us, embrace us, cleanse us, heal us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As we've just learned, Psalm 30, verse 5 says, For his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. Hear and believe the good news of the gospel. Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and cleansed. Thanks be to God. We have the privilege of joyfully celebrating communion together this morning as a body. This is the Lord's table. Anyone who has confessed with their mouth and believes in their heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, that God raised him from the dead, is invited to come and celebrate communion at this table. Hopefully you have a pre-packaged communion cup that you were given. If not, go ahead and raise your hand now and we can Uh, Make sure you get one of those right now. And if you're at home celebrating communion with us, please make sure you have your elements prepared and ready as well. We know that we have a deliverer. His name is Jesus. Jesus was the perfect son. Jesus obeyed the Father's will perfectly. Jesus humbled himself to his Father's will to the point of death, something that we could not do on our own. Philippians 2, 8 through 11 beautifully describes Jesus as being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every Every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus, the perfect Son of God, willingly hung on a cross to deliver you and me from ultimate death and completely free us from our suffering and our pain and our sin. And that is what we remember and celebrate at this communion meal because Jesus is is our deliverer. We can trust completely in God no matter what challenges come in this world. Because Jesus is our deliverer, we can bring our praises and our complaints and our fears and our joys, everything honestly and openly to God, knowing that he will protect us. He will care for us. He will envelop us and enfold us in his love and his mercy. I love how Psalm 30 describes our deliverance You turned my wailing into dancing. My sackcloth was removed, and you clothed me with joy, that my heart may sing your praises and not be silent. Lord my God, I will praise you forever. So weeping may come for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. And this is a morning meal. This is our hope in Christ. Father God, thank you for this meal. Thank you for this celebration meal. 
Thank you for sending your perfect son to turn our mourning into dancing, to turn our sin and rebellion into obedience to your will, to turn our death into life. May we honor you and trust your love as we celebrate this meal together. May we remember your birth, your death on the cross, and your resurrection from the dead. In Jesus' powerful name we pray. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took the bread and he broke it after he had given thanks and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Whenever you drink this, drink this in remembrance of me. Heavenly Father, thank you for feeding us with this spiritual food. Thank you that you sent your son to die, to raise from the dead, and one day we know that your son will return again. Until that time, Father God, may we know, know that in Christ, joy always has the final word. May we know that in Christ, we will be the community that you have made us to be, and I pray your blessing upon El Montecito Presbyterian Church and the men, the women, and the children who make up this body, the body of Christ. May we honor you in all things. May we continue to remember you in Jesus Christ's precious name. Amen. Well, we are encouraged that you are part of this Christ-centered community, and we ask you to continue to participate in all the fun events this summer, continue to pray for us as we move back to one worship gathering next week at 10 a.m., continue to find ways that you can serve the Lord in this community and in your community and loving your neighbors and being attractional, and always remember that we are here for you, hoping that you grow in your love for God for your neighbor, and for yourself. Please stand now as you receive this benediction from God's word. In John 14, 27, Jesus said, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you, not as the world gives you. So let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Amen? Amen. We have another opportunity. If you'd like to go down to the basement to see what's going on, you've got an insert in your bulletin as well about ways that you might be able to get involved. So if you didn't do it last week, we invite you to go down to, excuse me, the basement, the elevator, and uh, get a tour of what we've got in mind there for some exciting things at El Montecito Presbyterian Church. God bless you all.